Ephesians chapter 2. And if your pastor can find it, he will get started. There we go. Keith Green was a pioneer in contemporary Christian music back in the 1970s. And anybody remember that part back? <laughs> he wrote a song that was called My Eyes Are Dry. Does anybody ever remember that song? My Eyes Are Dry? Okay. Pardon? I'm sorry. I will tell you the word. I won't sing it. Okay? It was a testimony of his own struggle with complacency in the Christian life. Have you ever struggled with complacency? Just going on through the motions and not really caring and not being passionate about your love for the Lord? Well, this is, this is his struggle. Listen to this. My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. But what can be done to an old heart like mine, to soften it up with oil and wine? The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. Anybody say, I need that? That's what I need in my life. Sometimes we become apathetic. We lose our passion. Do you know what Jesus wrote to the church in Laodicea? I wish that you were passionate. I wish that you were either hot or cold. But you're just yucky in the middle, lukewarm. And because of that, I have to spit you out of my mouth. And whichever one of these two churches that you choose, that, that you think that's who uh, Paul was addressing here, he's addressing them a generation earlier, about 30, 35 years earlier. And he's telling them how to avoid the danger that they got into. And I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not up from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask you to help us to understand these very important lessons. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
I would like to suggest to you that these short verses from the book of Ephesians gives us three steps towards curing our complacency. The first step that we need to take into mind is first, remember what you were. I would like to suggest that some Christians suffer from spiritual amnesia. We're very, very forgetful. We enjoy the Christian life so much. We enjoy the fact that we're forgiven, that we have a new relationship with God, and that we know we're going to heaven. We enjoy that so much that we forget what we were before we became believers. So Paul reminds the church what they were. What were you before you became a Christian? Now, verse number one, you were dead. Who were dead? We are all made of body, soul, and spirit. I mentioned that when we studied uh, 1 Thessalonians. And our bodies are alive. Our souls, the inner personality is alive. But our spirits are dead toward God. Do you know if you know of anyone who's not a Christian, whether it be your family member or whether it be your friend or neighbor, if you know of anyone who is not a Christian, that's where they are. Their bodies are alive. Their personalities, their souls are alive. But the part of them that relates to God, their spirit, that part is dead. And as a result of being dead, they are separated from God, and they are not in good communication with God. They're dead. And what causes this deadness? Well, Paul states that we were dead. And Tim is not supposed to cross over this boundary line, or else he will get in trouble. But Tim is curious about the other side. What's over there? I'm kind of cramped for space. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I stepped over that? I know I'm not supposed to. I know that I've been told not to, but I'd still like to... I transgressed. I crossed over the boundary. When my brother and I were young, we were, my parents were painting the house. And uh, we were told to leave the paint alone. Well, you tell a four and five year old child that, and one of us is going to get in trouble. And I'm glad to report you it was my brother Richard. <laughs> because my mom came into the room and his hand was full of paint on both sides. He had uh, immersed his hand in the paint jar. <laughs> he had transgressed. He had done something that he was told not to do. Any of us ever transgressed? Done something that we knew better? We knew not to do? That's one of the reasons you were dead in transgressions. But the second one is sins. Now, we like to talk about sins of commission when you actually do something like transgress. But sins is more focusing on omission. It's kind of the archery range illustration. You have a bullseye on the wall there, and you want to do what you, what you can to get that bullseye. But every time you try, you're not good enough. You miss the mark. That's sin. And God has given us a standard in his word on how he wants us to live. 
But every time we try to live that way, in our own nature, we fall short. We're not good enough. We don't do what God wants us to do. And Paul says, you're dead in your transgressions. You've crossed over the line. And you're dead in your sins. You, you're not good enough. You've missed the mark. Both of these have been done by me. And as a result, I was dead in my transgressions and sin. Second, verse 2. Not only were you dead, you were disobedient. Paul says, you followed the ways of the world. Now, he doesn't mean physically dead, and he doesn't mean uh, uh, psychologically dead, so you're still awake enough to be disobedient. He says, we follow the ways of the world. What are the ways of the world? If you read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, he'll tell you the ways of the world. The lust or the desires of the eye, the desires of the flesh, and the pride of life. The lust of the eye is illustrated by advertising. Do you know why people advertise? The Super Bowl, some of the 30 second shots are, take millions of dollars to produce and to air. You know why? Because people see it and want what they see and they go buy it. And that's the lust of the eye. And has there, has there ever been a time when you wanted what you saw, but you knew you didn't, shouldn't have it? You lusted after that person on TV that you knew wasn't your spouse. You lusted after that car or that house that you knew wasn't yours. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, that's illustrated by... Uh, our friend uh, Jacob, remember the story of Jacob and Esau? And uh, he was making a pot of stew. And it was really, really good food, almost as good as what we had at the retreat. <laughs> and Esau comes home from a long day of work, and he sees that food, and his body is so hungry that he was willing to sell his birthright to get some food. He yielded to the lust of the flesh. And have you ever done things when you are hungry that you would have never done otherwise? So we were disobedient. We followed the ways of the world. We followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's talking about the devil. He is the spirit who works in those who are disobedient. In other words, there's a reason we're disobedient. It's because the devil is working at us all the time to inform us and to encourage us to be disobedient to God. Not only were we dead, not only were we disobedient. Look at verse 3, we were doomed. We all lived among the disobedient at one time. We all gratified our, it says in some translations, flesh, but it's, it's a good help, in my opinion, what other translations have done, where it says our natural sinful cravings. It helps this define what flesh really means. In other words, we do what comes naturally. Why do you want to have sex outside of marriage? Because it's so natural. I like it. But guess what? God says that sex outside of marriage is wrong. But we do it anyway. We follow our sinful desires and our thoughts. And because we're doing that, we become Objects of wrath. 
See, we love to talk about the fact that God is a God of love, and I believe that strongly. God is a God of love, but do you know that God is also a God of justice and a God of wrath? And God is going to take out judgment on a sinful, unbelieving world. And we have forgotten to say that, whereas sometimes we have deliberately avoided it because it's not politically correct. But God is a God of wrath. He is going to judge a sinful, unbelieving people. And that includes you and I. And because of that, we are objects of God's wrath, and we are in deep, eternal trouble. That's where we were before we became Christians. We were dead, disobedient, and doomed. And when we realize that's where we were before we became Christians, it should give us a passion for the lost. I don't want anybody else to be where I was before I became a Christian. And the only way out is not doing better or getting somebody to go to church, but is leading somebody to a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And that's what happens in this text. Look where it changes. Verse 4. But God, because of his great mercy and his great love for us, his rich mercy, he made us alive with Christ. So not only remember what you were, but realize what God has done. Verses 4 to 9. God has made you alive with Christ. The only cure for being dead in transgressions and sins is not a makeup job. Is not being dressed nicely and going to church. The only cure for being dead in transgressions and sins is to be being made alive in Christ Jesus. That's the only cure. And that's what God has done for us. Why? Because of his great love. Yes, he is a God of wrath, but he doesn't want us to face that wrath. So he made a way of forgiveness through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. His great love and his rich mercy. When we were dead in our transgressions and dead in our sins, when we could not help ourselves, that's when God came in. It is by grace you have been saved. Grace is unmerited favor. There is nothing that you can do to merit God's love. There is nothing you can do to merit God's mercy. There is nothing you can do to merit God's forgiveness. It is only because God is a God of grace that you have any chance. Not only did God make you alive with Christ, God has raised you up and seated you with Christ. You're living down in the dirt and in the mire like you used to live. You're not just an everyday earthworm. You've been elevated to a new height. And that is pictured in a beautiful way in a picture that I have in my office done by Johnny Erickson Tata. She took this beautiful illustration that we have in nature of a, a worm. And the worm's crawling on the tree. And then this worm goes into a cocoon. And it stays in that cocoon for some time. And then a miracle happens. That worm or caterpillar doesn't stay in that cocoon. Something amazing happens, <coughs> and that worm or caterpillar is transformed into a beautiful monarch butterfly. And she calls that picture 
get the, the worm growing up and the cocoon and the beautiful butterfly coming out. She calls it new life. And that's what God has done for us. And, and the caterpillar, caterpillar can't fly, but the butterfly can. My, myself, my sinful nature, I can't please God. But when I'm born again, I can please God. We are elevated. We have been raised up and seated with Christ. We are with Christ in heavenly realms. And by the way, that's where the blessings of chapter 1, verse 3 come from. They are in heavenly realms. Why has God done this? He has done this because he wanted to show us the riches of his grace. When, did he, when does he want to do this? He wants to do it now, but he wants to do it now with a continuing emphasis in our lives until the coming ages. So God has made us alive with Christ. He has raised us up and seated us with Christ. And the bottom line, verse 8 and 9, is God has saved you. How? You were saved by grace through faith. You didn't deserve it, but you believed it. It is a gift of God, not of any works that you have done. Why? So that no one can boast. If anybody tells you, <laughs> I'm a Christian and I'm better than everybody else in the world, you have the right to doubt whether they're really a Christian. Because if they're boasting of themselves, they haven't really understood that salvation is by grace. It's totally undeserved. I heard about a turtle that was found on a fence post. Have you ever found a turtle on a fence post? If you do, there's one thing that you know for sure, the turtle didn't get there by himself. <laughs> and as a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm a turtle on a fence post. I didn't get there by myself. I'm saved by the grace of God. So I remember what I was. I realize what God has done, and I'm feeling better already about my relationship with God. But that's not the end. Verse 10, you respond by what you do. If you really understand the predicaments you were in before you were a Christian, if you under, really understand the grace of God that made you a Christian, you will respond in love and dedication to God in thanksgiving for becoming a Christian. You will respond by what you do. You are God's masterpiece. Now, to make it sound, you know, down to earth, I say, I'm God's piece of work. <laughs> Think about it. I heard the story about a young boy. And this young boy carved a beautiful boat out of a piece of wood. And he made a little sail for it, and he tied a string to it, and he took it down to the riverside because he wanted to float this boat on the river. But as he was floating this boat on the river, the boy lost track and the string fell out of his fingers and that boat went down the current. Well, a little while later, that boy was walking through town. And as the boy walked through town, he saw a beautiful boat in a shop. And he found out through discussing with the owner that the owner had purchased this boat from a, 
another kid who had found it in the river. And the boy could see from looking at it that it was his boat. And the store manager said, I'm sorry, son. If you want that boat, you're going to have to buy it. So that boy went home and worked hard. And he got enough money. And he went back and he purchased that boat from the store manager. And he was heard to grab that boat to his chest and say to the boat, you're mine twice. I made you and I bought you. That's what God says to us. We are God's by every right. He made us. We are all his creation. But when he sent Jesus to the cross of Calvary, he purchased us with his blood. I made you and I bought you. And if we are his, we have no right to do what we want to do. We do what he wants us to do. It should motivate us to do good works. You are God's masterpiece. You are created in Christ Jesus. You are made new. And you are created for a purpose. And the purpose that God made you for is to do good works. Listen to me carefully. I do not become a Christian by doing good works. But I was made a Christian for the purpose of doing good works. I don't become a Christian by doing good works. But I was made a Christian for the purpose of of doing good works. So what is the cure for complacency? The cure for complacency is to remember what you were. Recognize what God has done and respond by what you do. Let's pray. You might be here this morning and you've never become a Christian. And what I shared about what we were like before we became Christians sounds terribly familiar to you because you've never become one. This morning you could become a Christian. God's grace is available to you. Jesus died for you. Your sins can be forgiven by simply believing in him. And if you would like to do that, I invite you to come and pray with me. Maybe you are a Christian, but you have allowed yourself to be complacent. And you would like a fresh start. You would like to rededicate your life to Christ and say from now on, I want to be totally committed to Jesus because he was totally committed to saving my soul. I'd love to have you come and pray with me. Maybe you want to show your faith by getting baptized or becoming a member of this church. Whatever God is speaking to your heart about right now, I'd love to pray with you. We're going to stand to sing our closing song, and while we stand, make your way to the front, and I'd love